Good evening. It's, is uh, anybody nervous? I am. I can tell you that right now. So tonight, it's about love and passion. And the way to have a beautiful life, you need to, to be happy and productive. This is what it's all about. So tonight, it's, it's one of those stories. For some of you that are not golfers, Pete Dye is the best golf architect ever, in my opinion, but also in many opinions. So Pete Dye, we were lucky enough that he built 90 holes of golf here at Casa de Campo. So Pete Dye was born in Urbana, Ohio, and before he was born, his dad built a nine-hole golf course, and Pete Dye became a very good golfer. He even won the Ohio State High School Championship. At 18 years old, he decided to join the Army. But before he was finished with his training, the war ended. So they sent him to Fort Bragg to maintain a golf course. Well, the golf course, I went too fast. The golf course that he built also was Donald Ross. Donald Ross was one of the best legendary also golf course architect. So Pete from there went to Rollins College. He met his wife. They had two kids, PB and Perry. And all time in his mind, he wanted to become a golf designer, a golf architect. Well, he had to make a living, so he became an insurance salesman. Did very well as an insurance salesman. And eventually he built a few golf courses. And to get better, he went to Scotland with his wife and studied golf course architecture, see all the rest of the things that he could learn and get better. And by the time he came back, he actually was a little bit, you know, his style was born at that point. And in 1968, he was brought here to Casa de Campo to build a golf course. Well, I was born in 1948 in Montreal, Canada. And before I could walk almost, they put skates on my feet. And the only thing I wanted to do was to become a professional hockey player. Well, by the time I was 18, one of my coach came to me and said, Jill, tu sais, tu es un bon joueur, mais qu'est-ce qui arrive si tu te fais blesser? So what it was, was, Jill, you're a good player, but what happens if you get a bad injury? So I didn't have a backup plan. But lucky enough, a coach from Michigan State University came and recruited me. And I went to school at Michigan State. I got there, I couldn't speak English. My grades were terrible, but I could skate and score. So I got in. I did stay there four years, and to surprise of many people, I did graduate. But during that time, I suffered some pretty good devastating injury that was really hurting my career as a hockey player. But during the time that I was there, all my buddies were going to Florida and having a good time spring break. I was stuck there to some rehabs and stuff like that, so I started to learn how to play golf. I had played golf a few times, but I started to practice and play and really go at this. And it's hard to believe, you know, when you think about this, a devastating, devastating injury, all of a sudden I learned to play golf and this was changed my life. So after I finished it, I did play professional hockey for a while and I got beat up pretty bad. So I decided then I was hired at Colgate University as an assistant hockey coach. Well, during that time, the golf pro retired. So they said, Jill, why don't you take that? You can play and why don't you take that over? So I did. I was there five years and all of a sudden, I get a phone call from somebody that said there's a position in the Dominican Republic as a golf director. My first question, where's the Dominican Republic? So um, the only thing they told me is that it was warm. I knew that a little bit. You know, it was warm. I wasn't great in geography, but I knew that. So it was warm, and it was freezing up north. So I said, maybe I should apply for that position. Well, it was a long story how I got here, but I did get here. At the time, my wife was pregnant and we landed in Santo Domingo and um, we drove from Santo Domingo to here. 
I have to say that during the two-hour drive 40 years ago, I was thinking I made a major mistake because I've seen more goats and chicken on the road than I've ever seen in my entire life. So, um, so we get to Casa de Campo, and, um, you know, it's beautiful, and I look at the teeth of the dog and lynx, and, you know, I'm, it's great, but it's not the Casa de Campo that you see today. There was no grocery store. There was no cinema, you know, movie theater. No television. Now that's a problem for me. And then to make a phone call, basically you had to call the operator and it took you a while to get it, you know, to get back. So um, it was, but we decided we were going to do that. So I started to work and I had to meet Pete Dye. I knew about Pete Dye, but I really did, you know, I, I knew who he was, but I never met him. So I met him the first time. We sat on the back of the ninth green, and uh, we're talking, and he's asking me a question about if I know about maintenance, if I know about this, and I can see as I'm talking, his head is kind of going down and down, and finally he gets up and walks away, and he says, obviously, you don't know shit. So um, I said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? The most important one, a guy in the world, and I'm already in trouble. So... He came back a couple days later, he gives me a list, he said, get to, uh, with the superintendent, who's at Nunez Malena, who's still here, he says, get things done. Well, I went back to my office and I look at the list and I went, I can't read this. I don't know what he learned at Rollins College, but it was sure not penmanship, I can tell you. So he came back three weeks later and he said, uh, he said, Jill, you didn't get anything done. I said, Mr. Dye, I can't read anything you write. I said, I don't know what it is. He said, well, you better start walking with me. So I start walking with Pete Dye, and uh, you know we were uh, we were out there walking and uh, you know playing a little golf, and then I got to the golf course one day and I said to him, "You need to take this off here." I guess. <laughs> I got to uh, to the golf course and I asked Pete and I said, um, "How did you come up with the name Teeth of the Dog?" So he said to me, well, he, he said, um, I was walking with some worker one day, and I was close to the water, and uh, he said that I walked close to, to the shore, and one of the workers says, Senor Pete, be quiet. He said, I mean, be careful. This is diente de perro. What is that? Well, he said, teeth of the dog. So he said, bingo. That's the name that we're going to name this golf course. Because originally it was Cahuilis 1, and when we built the second one, Lynx, it was Cahuilis 2. So he changed it, teeth to the dog. Well, this is the most beautiful course, and it's all over now. You know, people see it, and we changed the name to Teeth of the Dog, so it's catchy, right? And people see there's seven holes on the ocean, and, you know, it's all over. And at that point, in 1972, that was way before I got here, Golf Dad just came and made, you know, all kinds of story about it, and Sports Illustrated at a a bathing suit, you know, fashion show. It's too bad I wasn't here. Was that, 72? Um, but eventually, you know, we did, we did well, and uh, we got to the point where, you know, Pete always wanted to do some other things. But we came to the first Christmas. So I get to Christmas, I get a call from Pete Dye, and he said, Jill, I want you to, uh, to come and play golf with me this afternoon. So, you know, Christmas, my daughter actually was born a couple weeks before that in La Romana and Dr. Canela's clinic. And uh, so I go play golf and I get to the first tee and he said, well, Jill, you ruined my Christmas. I said, what did I do now? So he said to me, he said, well, um, you gave your wife that just delivered a baby, your daughter, two orange dozen golf balls. I said, yeah. I said, do you see any stores around here where I can go shopping? I said, what did you give to Alice? He said, nothing, but it's a heck of a lot better than two dozen golf balls. That's all I can tell you. So that's how we started the whole thing. I'm thinking, oh, my God, there we go again. I'm in trouble. So at one point, he said to me, he said, look, he says, we need to get some golfers over here. So we started getting, you know, I said, okay. He said, I'll take care of the golf course. You learn, you know, you bring golf golfers. So I started putting some tournaments together and I was calling some of the people that were already here, some friends, and we started getting some golfers. And eventually, uh, we were, you know, doing pretty well. 
So Pete says to me, um, we're going to build another golf course. Okay? But he said, I want you to come with me. He says, I want you to be out with me. Well, I went out with him, and we walk. I mean, if you can imagine when you drive out of here, you can see these fields and all that stuff, and I just couldn't see. And we were walking, and my legs get cut up, and Pete imagined all these beautiful holes and, you know, La Romana Country Club, and I'm thinking, what the heck? So finally, I have the courage to say to him, I said, Pete, look, I can't see anything. He said, okay. He said, I knew that all along. I only brought you because you take notes, you talk with me, and if I fall down, you're going to pick me up. So I did walk with him and uh, eventually built this, this amazing golf course. Well, I get a call one day, and he said to me, Jill, he goes, look, uh, I'm in Florida right now. He says, I want you to come to Florida. I got a bag I want you to take back to the DR. So I go back to his house, and I, he says, I said, what is in there? He said, don't worry about it. Just put it in your golf bag. So... I trusted the man, he was my friend. I put that in the bottom of my golf bag and I go through custom and immigration and I get over here and three days later, Pete Dye shows up. I said, Pete, what are you doing? I said, three days ago, I said, you couldn't have bring the, brought the bag? He said, well, it was a little problem. He says, you know, he said, uh, so I opened the bag. He says, if we'd gone through the agriculture at custom, he says, I could have had, you know, some travel, came in a private, I said, what about me? Oh, don't worry, we would have got you out. So I opened the bag, and inside the bag, there's three little baggies full of grass. Grass. It was seashore paspalum. Seashore paspalum is a grass that resists the salt water. So, and you could also, you don't have to use fresh water to, to uh, maintain and water the golf course. So Pete was thinking, okay, we need to save water. So... We took these, uh, these bags, and, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do, but he broke them, and he brought them to Nunez, and, and if you look at this picture behind me, that's die four. Every blade of grass on that golf course came from those three little baggies that we brought probably over 25 years ago. And it's changed maintenance, because when you're on the teeth of the dog, when you have a, a storm and the wave comes over and splashes and that grass survived. Well, after a little while, uh, my friend got dementia. So that was devastating for us and Pete kind of was losing things, didn't know where to go and so I, one day I took him on the golf course. I might not be able to make it through that. I took him on the golf course and we sat there on the cart and I said to Pete, I said, uh, Pete, you did good. You did very good. And he turned towards me, and he had a few tears in his eyes and a smile on his face, and I knew he kind of got what was going on. He had changed this country. He had changed it for tourism. Golfers were coming over here. People had opportunity. You know, they had jobs, and if you have a golf course, you're going to have restaurants, and you're going to have hotels, and you got... He is the one that changed the way people look at the Dominican Republic. Well, eventually, Pete passed away here in La Romana. And a few years back, he had written a book, Bury Me in a Pot Bunker. Well, the family decided that they were going to grant his wish. So, one day, the question was, where? Well, the family decided that he should be where the place that he loved the most. Casa de Campo teeth of the dog. So one day we went out there, there was a few of us, my wife, Mary Lee and I, and PB and his wife, and Mr. and Mrs. Kohler, and Nunez Malena, and we put his ashes right in a pot bunker. Well, you know, I'm not going to tell you where it is, <laughs> but it is in a pot bunker on the teeth of the dog, because he is where he want, always wanted to be. So, uh, when we walk away, I remember almost, you know, getting a little pull. My wife and I walking up the hill, and I get a little pull, and I'm thinking, you know, what is this? Honest to God, I felt it. And basically, my friend here through thick and thin, thick and thin, yes. Um, you know, he had cancer at one point, and he was not doing well, and he recovered. And, you know, I went through some ups and downs, and 
but we were always together. You know, we were best friend in the world. And it's like when I walked away, I could feel, you know, the love and passion that he was basically passing on to me. I already had the love and passion. I love this place to death. And I'm passionate about bringing golfers and bringing more people. Many, many people ask me, when are you going to retire? What am I going to retire for? I'm in heaven over here. I play golf every day. I bring golfers. I have friends. My daughter was born here. So I want to continue what he had started in some way. What we did somehow I felt, feel that I was, excuse me, I was part of that. Because it's, it's something that if you're lucky enough in your life to meet somebody like this, Canada, United States, French, English, hockey, golf, what are the chances of us getting together here in the Dominican Republic and becoming best friend in the world? So the last few things I can say is, Pete, you did good. You did very good. Thank you.